Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Gary Pollard. And I'm David Jones. This week on Red, White, and Blue, school safety in Texas, a very important issue, and we have three really good guests, David, who can help uh, us understand what we're dealing with and see if we can solve the problem. First, Paul Cordova, who's the chief of police for the Houston Independent School District, but I wanna, I'm gonna ask him later where his fifth star is. Secondly, uh, Captain Haley Carter, uh, and thank you for your service, Captain, who's chairman of the Mayor's Commission Against Gun Violence. And finally, State Senator Larry Taylor, Senator District 11, uh, very important state leader, and, and Senator Taylor was the leader and, and the leader of the, the committee of created in the Senate to look into this problem. So there you go, David. Everybody's got a role to play as far as solving the problem of school shootings. Um, and uh, yet I think that everybody should just let us know what impact this has had on your life. Seeing these shootings, getting appointed to various committees, you're on one, you're on one, you're on one. Um, what, what, what was the impact? Did it make you more likely to accept the responsibilities you've been given by the mayor and others? Or did you seek it out because you're an activist or what? I think a little bit of both. Um, you know, I, I'm relatively younger and in my early 30s, and I actually attend school here at the University of Houston Law Center. So um, seeing uh, the movement of students and young people really wanting to take accountability over the things that are happening in our schools is really, in it's incredibly inspiring. Um, and so, you know, as somebody that has an opportunity and has a platform, whether it's being a professional athlete in the city or growing up in Friendswood and having a network here, um, to be able to capitalize on that and help them sort of um, uh, spread their voice and spread their impact. and. Uh, to be able to sort of facilitate the conversation in a pragmatic manner. I mean, I, I definitely, I was approached um, by the city of Houston as a veteran in the community because the mayor wanted to make sure that veterans were included as a demographic on the commission. Uh, but I definitely, that was something I pursued once I was approached. It was absolutely, I absolutely want to participate on that. So. Well, Senator Taylor, you, you, you had the Senate Select Committee on, on School Violence. And uh, the legislature is actually going to be where the action is for a lot of things that could be done from the state because the legislature has authority. So uh, could you give us kind of your thoughts on what you learned uh, with, with the committee hearings you all have held so far that you think is important to and, you? And part of it was the Abbott 40-pager that uh, you probably had access well, to. That mm -hmm. can be another question. I mean, yeah. we got <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, it happened in my district. Santa Fe right. is an area I've represented for 16 years. So it hit pretty close to home. You know, we've seen it on TV and those types of things, but it strikes me. Gallatin County is a very interrelated community, so a community people live and work in different communities and it's just very interrelated. So it struck very close to home for a lot of us. And you know, you're not, burying a child is very hard and burying multiple children in back-to-back -back funerals is very difficult. So this is probably one of the most difficult things as a as a representative or a senator that I've had to do as far as an interim. We've had Harvey, we've had Hurricane Ike, but this was really difficult. And so being named uh, to chair that select committee on this by the Lieutenant Governor, you know, obviously I took it very personally and something I really have a passion for. I'm already involved with education anyway, so this is, you know, right. This, a lot of this stuff's gonna be happening in the education committee that I chair as well, so. So who's on the, who's on the sh committee, special committee that uh, Senator Patrick uh, formed, or, by, or rather, uh, you can ask What's his name job? All the members? Lieutenant, no, Lieutenant no. Governor. You don't need to name the members. <laughs> no. It was senators of uh, uh, yeah, uh, both parties. And this, I'll just tell you, this is a very bipartisan issue. Yeah. This is not something that has, there's any partisan interest at in all. You know, educating our kids is the number one priority of the state, just below public safety. Because if you're not safe, it doesn't matter if you get educated. But yeah. just below that is education. And obviously the safety of the students while they're in the school is about most. So any ideas that you heard, ideas that oh, you came we up had some, with? We had, we had four hearings, okay. four very long hearings, uh, dealing with infrastructure, uh, manpower, and, and, and ways of you know hardening with personnel. We heard about the mental health issues, and then we also heard about potential red flag laws and those types of things. And, and so our committee report has come out after the four, and we had very, very strong consensus issues, and some of those were also in the government. I sat on some of the governor's task force meetings as well. Obviously, the, the most important thing to do is prevent this, because you want to start happening, there's nothing good happens after that. Uh, but prevention is number one. So identifying kids who are at risk for potentially being that, and that involves mental health intervention counselors in our campuses, 
and you know, having people trained, even regular teachers to train to look for the signs of things. Uh, so that was a very important thing. Try to minimize the number of these things, reduce the number, but then minimize once it happens or once again hardening facilities and having more you know, school resource officers or uh, police, independent school district police departments there or the Marshall program in some areas. Just having a more immediate uh, response. Well, one that, of the problems that we just had, the, the access to the school was too loose. I mean, we just were... Well, you know, it's a high school. Right. You know, you know how high school is. Kids right. are moving in and out all day long. Right. You know, and like there are some things that people think are, are great. For example, a metal detector like we go through at the airport. But you realize at the airport, once you're in the secure area, everyone's in the secure area. We're not, you're not leaving for a second period or going to the gym over here and back. Right. There's just so much. There's a lot going on on a high school campus. So it's just much more complicated than that. So it's multifaceted. So there's not just one solution for anybody. But there were a number of things that we had consensus on, and that's what came out in that report. So do you think that uh, if we adopt the, the ideas that you've been talking about, that this can help uh, minimize the, 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 the risks? That minimize and then reduce the impact when it does happen. Well, I'm talking about, if I could focus on the chief. How do you identify the, the, the children or the students who are, have uh, better assess them for having issues that might, may cause them to decide that because <coughs> of whatever reason they want to come in and commit mass murder? I think it starts in the, in the home and also in the classroom. And so uh, we uh, want to train our teachers to help identify those uh, possible abnormal behaviors and, uh, like you said, red flag them and see what else is going on behind the picture. So what do you, what do you want the legislature to do to help you? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a pretty broad topic. I bet I know the first one. <laughs> 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 we all do. <laughs> Uh, what well, I'd, I'd like to see building codes. I uh, think oh. that's been discussed. Uh, we have building codes for fires worked very well for the last 50, 60 years. Uh, we need to have. I think we need to have building codes for building schools. And um, even recently, there's been schools that are not maybe not have security at the top of their priority list. And uh, I think and we want everything to be aesthetically pleasing and conducive to the learning environment, but. I think you really need to take security in mind when you build a new building. So Haley, you've had, uh, you're on a 37 member committee. Yes. Okay, so how often have you met? Uh, mm -hmm. Are you divided up into subcommittees for various mm -hmm. tasks? And if so, uh, I understand the mayor has m made certain recommendations based on your work so far. Yes. Can you tell us what they are? So, um, so we essentially, you know, 37 people, <coughs> is, that's a lot of people. That's and a if, big committee. if you look at the personalities on that, if you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <more laughs> if you look on the personalities um, of that commission, um, that there's a lot of passion and a lot of opinions and, and very strong, um, just very strong personalities. And so, to manage that, right? Like you can't you can't promulgate these pro these recommendations or proposals with just 37 people throwing whatever they've got into the room. So um, I did. I actually divided into seven subcommittees, and the mayor's charge initially, um, coming right after Santa Fe, was to focus on school safety, and so um, that obviously was a subcommittee. But also, you know, we didn't want to only be focused on school safety when you're talking about firearms and gun violence in the city of Houston and the greater Houston area. Uh, so we also looked at community safety. So what about theaters and churches and um, other places that there might be an issue? Um, the community-based intervention, prevention, and um, reintegration, which is really looking at like street organizations and what roles they may play in school violence. Um, domestic violence and sexual assault, firearm safety and access, and um, the obviously the gun violence is a public health issue, really wanting to touch upon the mental health issues, looking at secondary and primary prevention of these events. Um, and we essentially came together and our proposals, like I said, mostly were on the school safety side, um, but we did come up with some firearms and safety and access. Uh, community safety and um, domestic violence and sexual assault, many of those associated with the red flag laws. So, uh, um, red flag laws, that's the one yeah. that Senator Patrick says is never going to happen in the Senate. Well, I, I think he's strongly opposed to some of the red flag laws that may have been proposed. That doesn't mean we're not going to have a discussion of some ver variant of that. So, uh, I, I, it was not one of the consensus recommendations that came out of our commission. 
and we tried to do consensus things. We had a bipartisan group, and those were things we could build consensus around. Uh, there has to be a lot of protections involved in that because uh, you're talking about a, a constitutional right. So it's very you have to be very careful with uh, that. Haley, uh, back to finishing your thoughts and uh, your comments about mm -hmm. your commission. How many of the uh, recommendations did your committee come up with that the city could actually implement? Uh, itself so, without getting involved with the legislature, the so federal government. So there were there were quite a few. Um, to be completely fair, there was many for HISD and for some of the various school districts. Um, there are also some that are m focused on really community uh, violence awareness campaigns and uh, city the city night out program, like making that making gun violence a piece of the dialogue when we come together as a community. So there were several that are just relatively easy f both for the city to implement but also as concerned citizens for us to implement. Um, you know, there are recommendations here and, you know, personally I live in Klein, I live in Spring, so I'm not entirely impacted by things that happen in HISD, but that's not to say that I can't take recommendations here to my school district and say, have you seen these? Um, and, and implement them. And many of the things, the recommendations we made, of course there were things like the infrastructure piece and the um, increased police presence and those things cost money, right? That is significant resources. But there are other things such as the digital sandbox, um, the fusion centers, making sure that all of the schools in HISD participate in the digital sandbox program. That it's already in place. It's just a matter of getting the campuses just into the it. program. It's right. just a matter of doing it. So um, there are quite a few recommendations that are in there that are either they've, they've been created at some point and they're just not really being implemented or there are things out there that are just low hanging fruit that we've never really capitalized capitalized on in the past because there hasn't been this push. Um, push right? Very good. Anybody surprised that Florida was able to do as much as they did given that they're an NRA state, a mostly red state, with, with a Republican governor and a Republican legislature and yet they raised the, manage, the age limit for buying a weapon to 21. Uh, they installed a three-day uh, waiting period for the background check until it's finished. Uh, they banned bump stocks. Uh, they s armed certain employees uh, of the school system. They also have the red flag or whatever it is that allows them to go to court and take a gun away from a mentally incompetent or da dangerous person. Uh, and they allowed the police, I couldn't believe this, they allowed the police to bar a person uh, I assume somebody who has had a warrant issued for this purpose, bar barring them from having a weapon for an entire year. The and that's police, all interesting. That. And that's all interesting. But here's the question for you, General: uh, <laughs> If any of those reforms had passed in Texas, would that have stopped the Santa Fe shooting? No. Probably no. not. If if you're a law violator, you don't care about the law. That's right. But I, that's not to say that that's those are not. Uh, yeah, good laws to have. But it's important to be clear on the facts that when we say, oh, if we only had all this, it wouldn't have happened. Not true. It was going to happen. And, and as you mentioned correctly, the first thing you mentioned was parents. Right. That you said most important is engage parents with their children, understand what's going on. If there are issues, you got to do something about it. Right. So you don't, want to do, you don't want to do anything, Gary? I'm, 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 I'm interviewing our guests. Well, oh. if I can add to that, yeah. though, she talked about the community <laughs> involvement. You know, after 9-11, a lot of things changed. You know, people didn't sit on an airplane once they got hijacked anymore. You know, that was a rule up to that point. You just sat there whenever they went and waited till they took. That didn't happen after 9-11. And after these school shootings, students are starting to look around and be more, much more involved with what's going on with their fellow students. You know, that's interesting you mentioned that. After, after Santa Fe in the, in the juvenile, juvenile courts, we had almost 500 filings for terroristic threat, yeah. public, which is, by the way, a felony. It's a because of, Because, too. like you just said, Senator, people were much more alert and they were reporting and they reported to, to your colleagues and others it's in a different, different school world. districts. Yeah. So and so was saying that he's going to bomb the school. Well, mm -hmm. they call the police. You can't have. And, and some of these kids, it was like discussions, it was kind of a joke, they weren't serious, but. Well, Everyone took, but you never know. But so they've got to learn not to do that. Oh, no, no. I no. think the word is no. out now. Well, Chief, you may know this. I think it was an HISD student, but I knew of a lawyer who watched several in detention, in juvenile detention, and all they did was use their fingers playing. And they went to jail for, uh, you know, a threat of some sort. All, all the cases I've seen involve words or social media, very explicit 
what they're going to do today or tomorrow. And right. So it's not just pointing a finger, it's words and actions Pictures, that go with it. holding guns. Right. In fact, the, the interesting what the juvenile judges in Harris County did, every one of these cases, the kids came in charged with felonies, they had, them, they had them do a mental health evaluation before mm -hmm. they would even deal with their case yeah. to see if there really was a problem. And that sorts out, obviously, the truly mentally ill from those who are just copycats saying stuff to get attention or whatever. And the hand gesture, it's got to be the cir circumstances surrounding that. I mean, if they're doing it in a playful manner, that's one thing. If you're looking like you're threatening to be on some words or going along with that, I would take that as Context a very matters. serious threat. I guess yeah. that's part Absolutely. of the, the job yeah, of contextual educating. Clues. Yeah. The student bodies, that this is no joke anymore. Yeah, you mention not. any of this stuff, it is yeah. taken seriously because of everything bad that's happened. And that, that helps you obviously do your job because then the kids start reporting and you can talk to these people and figure out whether you've got a problem. And if I could add a big part of that sure. is social media. Right. You know, people have gotten used to saying things on social media they wouldn't normally say. Now they're saying it, but, but now people are much more aware and they're watching social media for these types of contextual clues as well. Yeah. Uh, well, here's an interesting question, and I'll, let's ask Haley, because she's the youngest. Uh, what has happened to our society? I mean, growing up, <laughs> I'm serious, Haley. Growing right. up, okay. I mean, I'm serious, growing up, look, we're, we're that older, is, that is loaded. absolutely. I'm going to continue. Uh, what's happened? Growing up, you know, you'd have fights. You'd have knife people would pull knives. You didn't have yeah, you didn't I have think, mass shootings at schools. So, it just didn't happen. Yeah. So you know, I I was, you know, I, I'm still old enough that I remember not having social media, right. and I didn't have a phone until I was like a junior in college. So probably a good idea. Um, yeah. I, I don't even I think the internet was around one. yet when I was <laughs> in school. But um, so you know, I, I think from. For the younger generation, you know, I, I have a child, and I, so I'm accustomed to dealing with bullying and stuff like that at school. And what I find is, unfortunately, and this is really driving the mental health piece, is that kids can no longer escape. They, it, you know, you may get bullied at school, but when we were kids, you came home, you went outside, you played with your friends, and that was it. You know, when you were at home, you were at home. But now, because of social media, you can't get away from it. So uh, all of these kids have smartphones and tablets and whatever, and if they're getting bullied at school, those same kids are bullying them when they get home on social media. And so, um, you know, I, I think really this is about raising our children to be resilient and one, to appreciate that bullying is not acceptable um, so that I don't want my son to be raised to be a bully, but that also that, um, that it's not acceptable, but then also to be resilient um, in terms of, you know, from a mental health standpoint that if you do need help, it's okay to ask for help. But, um, you know, and so I, I think, really honestly social media matters you know and you're right people just feel so emblazoned to go and say whatever they want because they're tweeting from their mom's basement and you know so there's just some terrible things that are out there people feel empowered to have an opinion as though their opinion now matters well, you know the people from parkland yeah. they went to to their government the seat of their government in florida to seek various changes of many of which i've already mentioned uh, they failed to ban assault weapons, they failed to ban high capacity magazines or to suspend the sale of AR-15s and they did not require private uh, back checks, I mean background checks. Mm -hmm. In other words, every, every gun that's purchased, even if it's private, needs to have a background check. They, did, they tried to get that, but they didn't get that. Okay. Um, so Would that have stopped uh, Santa Fe or Parkland, David? No. How do we know what's going to stop anything? Well, the, we do know because we know what happened. And so what happens with people like you who are the gun banners that every time there's a, there's a terrible, tragic school shooting primarily related to mental illness and bullying, as you all correctly pointed out, your, your answer is to ban, take away guns from law-abiding citizens because that's going to stop the problem. But you can ask the chief here, the problem is not law-abiding citizens having guns. The problem is crazy people having guns. Law-abiding okay? citizens or can go crazy. Law-abiding citizens can go crazy and kill people, yeah. and they do often. Okay, but not All in right? these cases. These are these kids got the kid got the gun from the mother. Uh, you know, it's not why they had the three day thing. None of this stuff. It's all just the right out of your playbook. We're going to ban guns, and every time this happens, that's the answer. As opposed to 
the responsible comments we've had from the panel today, which I think are important, of real ideas that may actually help protect our children. I don't remember saying I wanted to ban guns. Anybody, would pl would somebody yeah, please right. just get the core reporter to bring, read yeah. that back. I'll read through the lines. Yeah. <laughs> just read through the I'm lines, Dave, and that's where you're at. Yeah, that's, that's what you want me to look like so well, that you have something you to do. argue about. Because that's what you said. You want, let's say ban AR-15s. AR-15 is a rifle, a single shot rifle. It looks like an assault rifle because that's a design factor. Mm -hmm. But it is not a multi-shot weapon. It's not any weapon. different than what a 308 does. Exactly. From a damage standpoint. So see, standpoint. do you fall and for Santa all Fe this? Santa Fe involved a shotgun. Yeah, shotgun. There you go. 38 revolver. So. Yeah. So, so I think it's really important that parents or anyone who has a, a weapon secure it. And that could have prevented Santa yes. Fe. Well, that could be a local issue. And that is. That is actually one of our recommendations. So um, Make parents be we, responsible. Right. And I can say that um, something I'm really proud of with our commission is that gun control was never a phrase that was ever mentioned. Um, this is Texas, right? Like that. The minute that those You're two words. You're proud of that? The, I am. Because <laughs> the minute that those two words are muttered, people shut down. They don't want to be open about um, recommending a solution. They just, that is a divisive phrase. And so what we focused on was uh, more on responsible gun ownership. And if you are a gun owner, those guns need to be secured. Um, one of the recommendations was in Santa Fe, he was 17 years old, to include 17 year olds, you, they can't have access to your weapons. It can't be a free access um, sort of deal. You know, when a, I was Maybe it ought to be another crime. The I, parents get arrested when this happens. I would, I would think so. <laughs> if, the, if a parent gives a gun to a 17 year old who's not allowed to purchase it and it's proven that they did, then they need to go to jail. Well, if, especially if it's used in a crime. Well, well seventeen-year-olds are pretty sophisticated people. They're uh, not. Yeah. They're not seven, eight-year-olds. Sometimes yeah. I wonder. If you, you can lock it up, and the seventeen-year-old is going to know how you get it and all that. And yeah. So it's 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 challenging at that. I never had that level. problem at my house. But, but even beyond the guns, when you just talk about <laughs> violence, school violence. Right. There are numerous ways if somebody really wants to kill students that they can do it. They're going to do it not beyond guns. Really guns. And so, beyond guns. so that's why we need to be proactive in looking at mental health trying to identify, and frankly, we've had testified numerous times, if you catch these kids early on, when they start making that turn, yeah. that you can save these kids. Right. It's when they've been dwelling in it for months or years yeah. that it builds up to the level that where they're willing to go out and shoot and, someone. And, and that's true. If you look at the statistics someone. in the city of Houston, the vast majority of crimes committed with firearms are males between 17 and 23 years old. So if you get them when they're younger and you work mm -hmm. with them, so whether it's in the school or whether it's the street organization, it, it, so it, that demographic. Let's raise the age limit to 25. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why these twenty-three year olds ban guns, <laughs> chief. Let these twenty-three year olds don't need guns. <laughs> okay, maybe they don't need Let guns. Let me ask. Well, they may be actually police officers, uh, chief. Uh, how about I want to talk about <laughs> London? London banned guns, and and now they got a big problem with people getting killed with knives. Do you have a knife? Or knives? cars? They're talking about or cars. Knives. That's true. Do we have a knife uh, problem in HISD? We don't. Okay, not yet. Not yet. Okay. How do you check for those? Same way you check for guns? It usually by word of mouth information okay. that we get. Uh, anonymous tips that we find them. What are Good. you going to do, Senator Taylor, in the next session? What is your agenda? What, That's an open uh, there's a seven or eight things that Florida did. What are you going to do? Probably none of those things you listed, but what we are going to do is empower our districts and pr hopefully provide some funding sources for them to, one, harden their facilities, one, to be able, to, uh, secondly, to be able to hire some more intervention mental health counselors. Uh, and then provide training for our teachers to help identify the students that are, that are at risk of having these kind of episodes. Those are real things that we can do to minimize these things before they ever happen. Someone who's bound and determined to kill people will be able to do that. Uh, our, our job and try to try to find these kids before they ha get to that point. And I take it you've worked real closely with you, the San, Santa Fe oh, absolutely school right. district and gotten their input and ideas of what went wrong. And there's not any one solution. Yeah. You, Texas is a big state, very diverse. We've got West Texas. They don't have a, their own police department. Right. In fact, it could take yeah. 30 to 40 minutes for the police to show up. Yeah. So the idea of, you know, maybe HISD doesn't want to do a Marshall program, but they need something out there. So yeah. Marshall program works for them. So we're not, we're not mandating anybody to do anything, but we are making it legal for people to do various options that they can implement in their district, what works for them in that community. Well, wouldn't a background check work for everybody? Why would anybody oppose a background check? 
Well, we have a background check, but you're right, the private we don't because private individuals allow Yeah, and in Santa Fe, the mother would have been checked out and she would have been fine. She'd the kid fine. took the shotgun and killed people. I mean, yeah. Santa Fe was really, it went against the grain of all the other arguments you've ever heard because it had none of those. It had the shotgun. It had the, one of the oldest revolvers around. It's a 38 revolver. Been around a long, long time. These are not weapons of mass destruction as we normally would hear some of these guns referred to. These are just regular guns. And he's 17 years old, you know, obviously some family issues. I don't know who was home at the time he was able to get the guns, but at 17 years old, these kids are pretty sophisticated. It's not like you can just hide it somewhere or have a key that, they've seen you open up the safe, they know how you opened it. I mean, they, yeah. it's, it's more difficult in that situation. So we, don't, we only have a few seconds. Are your, is your commission still going? Yes. I'm, you're still meeting. So we are tasked with, um, our second set of recommendations is gonna be focused on trying to provide um, feedback for the legislature um, to empower Mayor Turner and the government relations team to be able to make recommendations to the legislature on things that um, that we come up with. And bring the Florida kids over here. Why don't we have them over as part of our effort? Why not? Thanks for being here, everybody. That Enjoyed was, the discussion. That comment was unnecessary. We need the, we need the Florida. Thank you we for being Florida. with us this week. Uh, See you we'll next be week. Yeah, we'll be back next week with another exciting topic. And David will talk about guns. <laughs> <laughs>